Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to give this webinar. Um, I'm really excited to uh, discuss some work that I'm doing along with colleagues at um, the USGS and, and other external partners. I'm thinking about um, post-fire debris flows and in particular about um, the sort of inundation piece of um, the, in it, uh, the post-fire debris flow hazard. So um, I'll get started with a bit um, of some background on what debris flows are, um, why they happen after fires, um, sort of bigger picture context of thinking about hazard assessments for post-fire debris flows. And then I'll describe um, in a bit of uh, detail a study that I did uh, along with a number of others thinking about testing different models for debris flow runout in the context of the 2018 Montecito uh, California event. So um, to start, I wanna get us sort of all on the same page about what a debris flow is. And um, to do that, I'm gonna include, uh, in theory, a video um, from one of our monitoring stations at the Chalk Cliffs uh, location in central Colorado. Um, so um, what I hope you can see here is that uh, debris flows are a, a fast moving type of landslide. Um, they can, they can um, reach very large speeds. They um, originate in uh, steep high order catchments. Um, they have high sediment concentration and they're quite mobile because of high pore pressures. And this um, means that um, motion of these, um, motion of these types of geophysical flows continues on a lower sloped ground. Um, debris flows can also jam and avulse. Uh, they can carry large boulders and um, they're more common after fire. So I'm, um, Let's next think about why they're more common after fire. Um, Greg, I maybe have frozen. Yeah, your slide is not advancing. My slide is not advancing, okay. You I might will... come out of presentation mode and go back into it again. Ah, okay, now things are moving again. Okay, I seem to be advancing. So I will um, let you watch this great video. Well, I'll just note the scale. If, if I were standing in this uh, channel here, um, I would be, uh, shorter than, you know, standing from the channel to this uh, crossbar. Um, I may have frozen again. So in just a moment, hopefully I'll regain the ability to um, advance my slide. Okay, great. It's the only video. Um, so next, I want to talk about the connection between fires and debris flows. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the um, sort of uppermost reaches of a catchment in uh, south central New Mexico, where uh, debris flows initiated after um, a fire um, in 2020. And um, we, we know that fire changes soil properties, which leads to increased surface water runoff. Uh, vegetation is um, removed due to fire. Um, this reduces interception of water and um, changes surface roughness. And then uh, most commonly, we find distributed debris flow initiation through processes like raindrop driven detachment, transport, sheet wash, and rilling. And um, if you look very closely here, you can see the erosion of the surface soil um, where 
the um, debris flows in these catchments originated. Um, once started, debris flows can be highly erosive. They entrain sediment and grow in size. And, and on the right, you can see a picture from the same site in New Mexico, you know, maybe a half a kilometer, quarter of a kilometer downstream, um, where now the debris flows um, having passed through here have um, eroded into the, um, into the channel. So um, to sort of illustrate the big picture hazard of post-fire debris flows, I want us to consider the Thomas fire. So we're looking at a perspective map of um, Montecito, California um, in this area here. Um, and after the 2017 or during the 2017 Th Thomas fire, um, the burn intensity of which is shown here, a major rain event um, occurred resulting in, in a debris flow. And we'll talk a bit more about this event um, um, in a little bit. But you know, after a fire and before a storm, what are the types of things we might want to be able to um, forecast? These sorts of things are, um, for example, when will a debris flow occur? Um, which we might call debris flow probability. Um, and at present is um, addressed using empirical rainfall intensity duration thresholds based on uh, many years of observations of what rain um, results in debris flow occurrence. We might also want to know how big the debris flows are going to be, um, what their volume will be. Um, and right now, um, there are a number of tools, but in um, Southern California, uh, most commonly we use a statistical model uh, that's based on um, basin characteristics like topography and soil and rainfall characteristics. Um, and then, you know, given that a debris flow is going to occur and um, it's of a particular size, we may want to know something about where it will go. This is this sort of debris flow inundation um, aspect of the um, hazard assessment. So um, the USGS has worked um, for a number of years in collaboration with um, external partners, um, thinking a lot about uh, this um, question of, you know, what will um, sort of what types of rainfall events will result in debris flow uh, occurrence, and um, also on the, the question of how large. Um, but you know, we might want to ask, you know, how is it that we move towards being able to create a hazard assessment that says something about where material will go? And as you can see from this um, picture in the bottom right, which is of um, uh, Interstate 70 in central Colorado through Glenwood Springs, the um, Grizzly Creek fire burned uh, both sides of the um, canyon. Um, and then in uh, last summer, we had a number of rainstorms which resulted in debris flows, which you can see, they blocked the interstate, um, damaged the road, um, and you know, the response to that is still ongoing. So um, as a result of a number of decades of work by current and former USGS scientists, including, um, but not limited to Sue Cannon, Jason Keane, Dennis Staley, Joe Gardner, and Francis Rengers were able to make maps like what I'm showing here, which is a statement um, of um, the sort of propensity of a basin to yield a debris flow um, given a design storm. Um, and we um, generate, these sorts of hazard assessments when asked by partners to do so. Um, but you may note that this um, hazard assessment only includes information about where the debris flows may originate. It does not include information um, like that, which is shown here, um, which is the uh, debris flow runout that occurred after severe rain in January, 2018. It also does not include information um, about um, building damage, um, such as the buildings shown here 
And unfortunately in this event, um, 23 people uh, died. So I wanna note that a uh, thing that I think is quite interesting about um, debris flows and post-fire debris flows is that um, they're really a hazard at at all sizes. So, you know, I've shown you here um, this, this picture in, on the left-hand side of, of Glenwood, Sprint, um, or Glenwood Canyon. Um, we've talked a little bit about the Montecito, California um, event, but we'll talk about it more. And then in the upper right, I'm showing um, an aerial photograph taken from a helicopter um, of the dodson warrendale fan in the Columbia River Gorge. And uh, just over a year ago, this is the location where a, a passing motorist was, was killed um, because of this uh, debris flow um, runout path. And so, you know, we have a lot of, you know, we, we want to be concerned about these events, you know, both when they're quite small and when they're quite large. And, and in particular, the small events can be challenging for for linear infrastructure like, um, like roads. Um, so one of the challenges, however, is that you know, it's quite hard to forecast volume. Um, so this is you know, given the amount of rain we might anticipate, should we be able to forecast that well, um, what types of debris flow volumes might we encounter? Now, the work um, that underpins the you know, present um, empirical model that we use for forecasting debris flow runout is sort of really based on a lot of hard fought um, data to be able to make a statement about um, forecasting volume, you, know, you need to measure uh, debris flow volumes. Um, and, and there's a lot of imprecision that comes in the, um, from this type of data you know, many of it comes from sort of counting the number of dump trucks that were used to um, remove material from um, debris basins. And, and, you know, I think that it's quite impressive that we can um, do the aspect of, of volume forecasting that we can, and that sort of reducing uncertainty in volume forecasting is a big challenge. And to give you a sense of sort of how big a, a range of uncertainty we have in, in volume um, in this upper, uh, upper right-hand panel, I'm showing for sort of three subdomains of the Montecito um, uh, event, um, the Montecito Creek, San Ysidro Creek and Romero Creek um, domains, sort of the, the black line is the mean value we would expect from um, this volume model as a, a function of changing rainfall intensity. And then um, the, the star and um, error bars are sort of what we might expect the, um, or sort of our best estimate of what the event itself was. And you might notice the y-axis that's on a log scale of reflecting um, just how wide a range of volumes we might expect. So another, reason that um, forecasting debris flow runout may be challenging is that debris flows jam and avulse. Um, to illustrate that here, you, know, you can see this uh, sort of avulsion path on the dodson Warrendale fan. Um, and then here is an example of a number of um, sort of, a, of, of course material blocking the channel. So, um, uh, debris flows can create levees, which steer the flow, and sort of all these things um, taken together may make them quite challenging sort of to forecast where the material goes. So um, because of this, you know, debris flows um, and their inundation hazard assessment are not well reflected by um, existing available things like, um, for example, FEMA flood maps. So, you know, with this sort of general introduction to, you know, why we might want to forecast debris flow runout. Um, I'm going to um, start the talk by, um, and the majority of the talk will be focused on how well can we simulate the Montecito event and, and how 
by really digging into a multi-model comparison in the context of that event, you know, what can we learn about forecasting runout? And then um, I'll briefly end with some um, sort of in progress, um, in progress work on um, what kind of information do professional decision makers want about inundation? So um, to start, I'm gonna go through in a little more detail um, what happened in this um, January 9th, 2018 Montecito event. So as I said earlier, um, you know, Montecito, it's in California um, and um, it's located to the east of Los Angeles uh, between the Pacific Ocean to the south and the Santa Ynez Mountains to the north. You can see Highway 101 running along um, its southern side and there's an alluvial um, fan to the south of the Santa Ynez Mountains, which is quite urbanized. So the Thomas fire started on December 4th, 2017. And at the time that it completed, it was the largest fire in California history, about a quarter of the size of Rhode Island. Um, and on the left, you can see, or sorry, the right, you can see the soil burn severity map for the portion of the Thomas fire to the north of Montecito which is primarily burned to moderate severity, shown in yellow. But you can see from these photos on the left um, that you know, that is quite a, a severe uh, burn state. So on January 2nd, the USGS released a post-fire debris flow hazard assessment um, shown um, on the left. And as we've discussed, these um, debris flow hazard assessments, you know, tell us information about susceptibility to debris flows, to think about rainfall initiation thresholds and how large um, debris flows might be, but they don't tell us about where the debris flows will go. So our timeline now takes us from December 4th when the Thomas fire started to January 2nd. Um, on January 5th, in anticipation of a forecast storm, the Weather Service issued an outlook for debris flows. Um, on January 8th, uh, Santa Barbara County issued the largest ever evacuation orders. And then in the early morning hours of January 9th, the Weather Service issued a warning, followed um, shortly by a 50-year rain burst over Montecito um, with storm totals nearing 100 millimeters in some places. Um, this mobilized 680,000 cubic meters of sediment um, from the hill slopes and channels in the, the burned San Ynez Mountains. And the areas that were um, inundated by debris are shown in gray, cutting through this urbanized alluvial fan. Um, there were very large boulders mobilized. You can see um, Francis Rengers for scale in the, the picture on the left. Um, and then this resulted in 23 fatalities, over 167 injuries and, and 408 damaged homes. The uh, locations of houses that were damaged uh, between one and 50% are shown in orange and, and those um, that had over 50% damage or complete destruction were uh, destroyed. So how does this event sort of compare in terms of, um, sort of total mobilized volume and total inundated area with sort of other, um, other debris flows? To put it in context, um, we can compare this event with um, the existing compilations of debris flows um, from Griswold and Iverson uh, shown in purple and from Bernard and others shown in brown, um, which relate the um, mobilized volume on the x-axis and the inundated planimetric area on the y-axis. And so this event, you know, again, broken up into sort of three main domains um, is shown uh, by the yellow, green, and pink uh, diamonds. And so you can see from this that, you know, for the volume, this event was highly mobile, inundating a very large area. So, um, you know, 
as I've mentioned at the USGS right now, we provide information through our emergency assessments about where and under what rainfall conditions debris flows are expected to occur. Um, but we don't provide information about expected inundation. And so the um, study that I'll now describe in more detail um, is going to test a number of candidate models to understand their suitability um, for use in um, inundation hazard assessment. So I'm going to discuss a numerical modeling study in which I set up and run simulations of this inundation event with three candidate models simulating debris flows, which vary in the representation of debris flow physics. Um, Model performance is assessed on the overlap between simulated and observed debris flow extent, um, as well, oh, excuse me, as well as um, peak flow depths. Um, and each model takes between three and five inputs, which I find sort of useful to separate into um, two categories, the total volume of moving material and the sort of mobility or flowability properties. Um, today, we're going to primarily focus on the role of volume um, in succeeding in, in forecasting the event, um, but we'll also think a little bit about um, how well um, we need to know the material properties. Um, and then um, we're going to compare uh, the uh, best results um, from the different models and see how um, how well they um, how well they do. Um, I also uh, included an aspect of the study where I uh, use sort of an, an expert judgment. Uh, we might say you know user manual value based statement um, of setting up the models to sort of see how that compares with um, the best fits. Um, so I want to note that you know many times when studies are done sort of in a um, hindcast context, you know we know what the volume is and we may set what the volume is and explore how well material properties, um, you know how how we need to sort of modify those to get a good model fit. But you know because the volume of material mobilized is one of the largest sorts sources of pre-event uncertainty. You know, by exploring the sensitivity of the model to this input in a, a well-constrained experiment, we set ourselves up to sort of understand how uncertainty in volume propagates into uncertainty in inundation in a hypothetical pre-event context. So now I'll talk a little bit more about the three models we use. Um, the three models uh, were RAMs, Flow2D, and DCLAW. Um, all models solve depth average conservation equations uh, supplemented by constitutive relationships. An example simulation is shown in the animation. And I want to note that there are really two main distinctions between these models. Um, first, uh, DCLAW is a bit more complex than the other two models because it instead of considering the movement of a sort of single phase of material, it considers solid material embedded in a fluid phase, the interactions um, between those two phases um, and, and the sort of effective rheology of the material um, originates from that interaction. Um, in contrast, RAMs and Flow2D um, are um, single phase models um, and they represent two alternative ideas for the shear rate versus shear stress or constitutive relationship of the fluid, um, each of which um, has its own name, the Volemi or, or quadratic um, rheology. So I um, apply each model to three domains. The first is the Montecito domain, which is in orange. Um, the second is the San Ysidro domain in green, and the third is the Romero Creek domain in um, purple. And I, I treated these areas separately um, for a few reasons, um, in computational as well as because um, 
the observations of um, of sort of average sediment concentration based on sediment deposit and maximum flow depth um, make it look like these um, three domains um, could have been quite different during the event. Um, the, in the majority of the talk today, I'm going to present um, results focused on the, the Montecito Creek domain. So at each site and for each model, I run um, many simulations varying the input parameter ranges. And to do this, I first define the parameter space. I sample it with a Latin hypercube design, in this case, at least 100 times the number of input parameters and assess each uh, simulation's performance. And um, as I've said before, we're, you know, we're going to consider a really large volume range um, surrounding our estimates of flow volume for the event because we want to understand how the models behave at a, a wide range of volumes. Um, so how do I assess simulation performance? Uh, I do this in two ways. Um, the first is um, an extent misfit metric, um, which is called modified omega t. I modify the um, the metric provided by um, this paper to make it um, have a, a um, good value um, when it's zero and a bad value when it's one. Um, so it's a statement of the um, difference between sim simulated and observed extent of material. Um, so um, if they perfectly overlap, we have a, a value of zero, the best possible. And if they're perfectly disjoint, um, we have a value of one. I also um, look at the um, peak flow depth. So I split a sort of misfit statement of uh, peak flow depth um, into two parts. The first, which is called uh, delta U is the normalized sum of underestimates and delta O is the normalized sum of overestimates. And um, these are normalized by the sum of all depth measurements um, within sort of the given runout domain in order to make the values comparable between domains. And, and I split these apart because I wanted to distinguish between over and underestimation as we um, sort of explore different volumes. At some point though, in the study, I needed to choose um, sort of a best fit. And so I needed to combine the extent and depth misfit um, values. And um, to some extent, this is arbitrary, um, but I think, you know, very reasonable. Um, and I um, combined these sort of three elements, the extent, overestimate, and underestimate, um, such that I gave 50% of the importance to matching extent and 50% to matching depth. Um, and you may have noticed um, that I, I ensured that these all um, sort of scaled between zero for best and, and one for worst. So um, now recalling that for each model in each domain, we sampled parameter space many times. Um, we might, um, you might ask, you know, what do the simulations that minimize this misfit metric look like? So um, we'll now look at those results for the Montecito Creek domain. Here are the results for um, RAMs. Um, in dark green is the true positive area where debris flow is both observed and simulated. Light green is a false positive area where debris flow was simulated, but not observed. And then in light brown is the area where debris flow was observed, but not simulated. And you may notice that the um, simulations, uh, simulation matches the observations um, quite well. And so next let's see what it looks like for flow 2D and, and D-claw. Um, I think, the biggest takeaway I'd like you to have from this is that the results are quite similar. Um, and in addition to being quite similar, the many of the places where 
the simulations struggle to match the observations um, are in the same places. So for example, we have overestimation at the red and yellow um, circles. And um, then we have underestimation at this purple circle. So next I'm gonna show you um, results that explore um, changing volume and seeing how um, simulations um, vary as, as volume is changing. And this um, slide gives you a sense of the type of variation that I'm simulating as I change volume from on the left where I have um, quite low volumes and I'm you know, su substantially under inundating the simulation domain. And um, on the, the right-hand side where I have quite high volumes and I you know, I'm again doing poorly, but in a very different way. Um, so this slide uh, explores how simulation performance is related to volume. Um, each column is for a different model, RAMs, Flow2D, and DCLAW um, from left to right. Each row is a different metric. On the top is this combined cumulative metric. In the middle is our extent metric. And at the bottom, the peak, um, sort of a, a combined version of the peak flow depth. So it just averages the two elements. Um, on the x-axis is the log of the flow volume. And on the y-axis is, is, you know, how um, is the metric value with a good value being zero and a bad value being higher. Um, the vertical black line represents our best estimate of how large the actual um, flow was with a, a sort of an arbitrary um, error range. And um, each dot represents a single simulation with different um, flow um, mobility and volume parameters. And so as we expect, you can see both poor performance at high and at low flow volumes um, for all metrics and all models. Um, but when we look at the sort of best possible performance, uh, we see that all models do comparably well. Um, we also see that the models perform their best when the volume used for the simulations is the same as the estimated volume for event. For the event, that is the, the sort of bottom of the U is at the same, more or less the same place as um, the, the vertical line. Um, I think it's also notable that we see that the, um, the models perform the best when um, they both have um, sort of comparably good values for extent and depth. And I think this is a thing that we might, we would hope to see our models do, um, that they're matching extent at the same time that they're matching depth. Um, but, you know, that's uh, not, not necessarily a, a given. Um, so it's nice to confirm this. Um, next, I want to look into how the um, different metrics trade off. So um, what we're gonna do is look um, for each of the three models on the, um, in our columns and each of the three domains, which are in the rows, we're gonna plot the um, two depth metrics on the X and Y axis. Um, and then we're gonna, um, plot, uh, use color to show the extent metric. So if we have no material coming into the domain, um, we're going to plot at that um, blue, blue dot. And if we have um, material that is way too thick everywhere, um, we're going to plot at the orange dot. If we perfectly match um, the extent and depth um, we're going to have a yellow dot that's located um, at the origin. So um, 
we might expect that the relationship looks something like these uh, two blue lines here, but you know exactly you know how closely these um, different you know matching these different um, performance metrics um, and sort of how how scattered they are made you know is going to tell us a lot about how the models um, are influenced by both um, volume and material properties. The results look something like this. And um, again, um, I would say the, the what I think is most notable to see here is um, one, we don't end up at the origin. Um, we never you know, perfectly match um, the extent or um, the depth that um, there's very little scatter across, you know, on this line, except um, in the, the Rams model. And I think what this really means is that as you're changing volume, you're sort of quite smoothly transitioning from, um, you know, not inundating enough areas deeply enough to um, inundating areas too much. Um, this sort of gives us a, a, a premonition that we may expect the material properties um, and, and mobility might not matter so much here, which is a thing we'll um, dig into in a few slides. So um, I think I've, I've summarized these points. And so now we'll move on to um, looking at um, the influence of the non-volume parameters. So on this slide, um, what I show on um, each panel is a different um, non-volume input parameter. So um, at the top, um, you can see it says D colon M naught minus M crit. So that's the D claw parameter of initial solid volume fraction minus critical state solid volume fraction. Um, and then um, we have all of the non-volume parameters for, for D claw with a D, flow to D with an F, and then RAMs with an R. Um, and, and for the purposes of, of today, we're not going to pay too much attention to exactly which parameters um, these are. Um, uh, but we have um, the log of volume on the x-axis and the value of our um, our combined metric on the y-axis. Uh, we again have the um, sort of value, uh, estimated value for the size of this event in uh, the dashed line and then a sort of arbitrary error range in the gray box. So if we plot all of our um, simulations, you know, we see something similar to what we saw before, um, except now the dots have different colors. And what I've done is I've colored the dots by the input quintile. So I sampled these values um, in, a, um, in a uniform distribution. And, and so I've just, you know, the, the lowest quintile is yellow um, and, and so forth. Um, the, the final thing I do to look um, into this is I take the um, conditional mean within each of these quintile bins as a function of um, volume. So um, now these lines show that conditional mean. Um, and if all the lines plot on top of one another, that's indicative of um, that particular parameter having um, very little influence on the results after we've controlled for, for volume. And the sort of main thing that I would take away from this slide is that broadly speaking, um, most of these parameters have very little influence on the, um, on the um, um, performance of the models, indicating that at least for this event, um, sort of the most important thing is to get the volume um, right. Um, you know, this may not be uh, particularly surprising, but I think it sort of really emphasizes the importance of, of being able to forecast volume. Um, and it also motivates exploring um, the extent to which this is transferable to other, um, other events. 
Next, let's ask how does um, performance uh, degrade? And so here, uh, what I'm showing is the um, results for the RAMS model um, in which, and, and we're looking just at the Montecito Creek domain. And on the um, left-hand side, I'm showing the Montecito Creek do, uh, domain parameter values. So I've used the best values for that, you know, the best fit values for that domain. And then for the other th um, three columns, I've used the best fit values for the um, San Ysidro Creek domain um, and the Romero Creek domain. And then again, our sort of expert, my expert opinion parameter values. And what I'd like you to notice is that there's really not a big difference between these um, simulations, again, emphasizing uh, the importance of, of, of um, being able to forecast volume. Um, we can do the same thing for the Flow2D model, and it looks quite similar. And finally, we can do this for the um, DCLAW model. And so um, I'll, I'll um, to sort of conclude this um, first majority part of the talk um, by summarizing what we've learned from really digging into this particular event. Um, so um, we found that you know, all the models simulate the event quite well. Um, they struggle in similar parts of the domain. Um, and um, we find that we have good performance for the models um, at the same time um, that we match inundation um, patterns and peak flow depths. Um, volume is by far the most important input, though, um, you know, this was a, as, as we saw very early on when I compared this event with sort of other um, debris flows, um, this may be because of just how mobile this event was. And we find that performance degrades very little from when we exchange parameter values from, from domain to domain. So um, what I'd like to do in the last couple of minutes um, is talk a little bit about um, ongoing work, thinking about a, a user or ongoing work um, to generate a user needs assessment um, of professional decision makers in Southern California. And um, I, I guess the way I conceptualize why you might want to do something like this is that, you know, right now we have this um, left hand uh, blue circle sort of what is scientifically possible. Um, but as a scientist, I have a number of choices that I can make in, in what studies I do and how I, how I pose them. Um, and if I um, sort of gain um, an understanding of how potential users of this type of information may want to use it, that allows me to sort of make choices about what I study and how I study it so that um, I can maximize the usability of, of the science. And I really think about this as a, a sort of an ongoing iterative um, process and conversation um, in understanding you know, what, what information um, decision makers um, need, how di different decision makers need different input and, um, you know, and using that to guide um, you know, choices in, in, in setting up studies. So um, in this work, um, which was funded by the USGS Risk Community of Practice, uh, along with two colleagues, Veronica Romero and Katie Clifford, um, we uh, had conversations with uh, county and state emergency managers, floodplain managers, bear and work team leaders, um, and weather service professionals, so sort of a wide range of potential professional decision makers who might want to use this type of information. Um, we focused this 
um, in, in Southern California because of the you know, sort of greatest need and experience. Uh, we had, um, I think, 14 or 15 participants. Um, we found that this uh, group of participants was highly motivated and almost everyone agreed to participate, which we're very thankful for. Um, and we did a series of one hour long sort of unstructured interview conversations and then analyzed this um, through a um, sort of thematic um, qualitative coding scheme to understand sort of current practices, stated needs, and um, existing trade-offs that we might face in, in, in research. So I'll um, describe some lessons that we learned from this process, the first of which um, is focused on actually the uh, process of setting up such a study, um, which is that it was quite important to respect different forms of expertise. Um, constructing this interview instrument required that um, all three of us uh, brought our sort of capabilities to the table. Um, it took, I would say, quite a bit more work than I expected to come up with a very good interview instrument, um, but this really paid off in um, our eventual analysis because our, our, our interview sort of conversation guide led us um, to the information that we were interested in understanding. Um, and that doing this required that I articulate places in my research where I actually could make changes based on user input. And that was quite different from what I'm used to doing in, in, um, in sort of in, in, in doing research. So, uh, but this was quite important because spending time thinking exactly about what information could influence um, sort of the direction of research is a way, is sort of the most important way to demonstrate respect of participants by asking um, questions with answers that we'll use. So what were some of the things we learned? Um, so we asked participants what kind of data or features uh, a potential tool might contain and how they envisioned using it. Um, and some of the answers you can see here, you know, they spanned um, from you know, deciding where evacuation zones could be, might be delimited, um, educating decision makers and the general public um, and determining where um, emergency response personnel and other resource could be allocated. Um, we asked um, participants to choose between inundation information over a very large area with less detail or a small area with more detail. And, and broadly speaking, most participants opted for an inundation information over larger areas. Um, and when asked what characteristics about debris flows, uh, post fire debris flows pose a threat in the um, the most um, sort of the the most common answer was really a focus on where debris flows um, intersect with with people um, and and roadways relevant for um, egress and emergency access. Um, in part, I think because many of the sort of thresholds for closing roads are are relatively small um, compared with um, the types of, of flow depths we can generate with debris flows. So to close, I'll, I'll just sort of pose some future directions and questions. Um, you know, one thing I think is, is quite motivating is, you know, how transferable are the results that I've, I showed at Montecito to other locations? Um, how um, do these models compare and how do they compare with other um, other existing models uh, when compared with other outputs that may be better indicative of the sort of dynamics of the event, like um, sort of flow front and interior distributed velocity. I think a big picture um, challenge is to reduce uncertainty in volume forecasts. Um, um, similarly, uh, making linkages between field observations um, and um, Sort of model parameterization. Um, and finally, you know, because um, to be meaningful for a sort of pre-event context, 
um, we need to, we don't know what the event actually is. Um, we have to design meaningful scenarios for, for inundation hazard assessments. So with that, I think I've left about six minutes for questions and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to discuss.